Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you today. I know there's also probably a not insignificant number of people who, who feel they have to stay home right now, and so we're glad that they can see us even if we can't see them, and we're all able to worship together through technology much more so than we could without it. For the service today, we're going to be following the common service, and if you haven't already noticed, one change that I think will make for as long as we all need to be wearing masks in church is that we will just be skipping the first hymn, just because it's not as fun to sing wearing a mask compared to otherwise. So we are going to sing, of course. I view singing as something which is inseparably connected to worship, but anyway, I think we'll do that for a bit. So we'll begin today with the invocation, and please rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Let us bow before the Lord and confess our sins. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess to you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. I ask each of you, in the presence of God, who searches the heart, do you confess that you have sinned and do you repent of your sins? I do. Do you believe that Jesus Christ has redeemed you from all your sins? And do you desire forgiveness in his name? I do. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God to all of you. And in the stead, and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. May he comfort your heart by his holy absolution and strengthen you by his sacraments that your joy may be full. Peace be with you. Amen. Amen. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. You have been my help. Do not leave me or forsake me, O God of my salvation. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear?
be to God on high. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let us pray. O oh God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things as surpass our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love toward you that we may love you above all things and lead us by faith to your eternal promises which exceed all that we can desire through jesus christ your son our lord who lives and reigns with you and the holy spirit one true god now and forever Amen. You may be seated. The Old Testament reading is from the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 16, verses 14 through 21. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when it shall no longer be said, as the Lord lives, who brought up the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But, as the Lord lives, who brought up the people of Israel out of the north country and out of all the countries where he had driven them. For I will bring them back to their own land that I gave to their fathers. Behold, I am sending for many fishers, declares the Lord, and they shall catch them. And afterward, I will send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and every hill and out of the clefts of the rocks. For my eyes are on all their ways. They are not hidden from me, nor is their iniquity concealed from my eyes. But first I will doubly repay their iniquity and their sin, because they have polluted my land with the carcasses of their detestable idols and have filled my inheritance with their abominations. O Lord, my strength and my stronghold, my refuge in the day of trouble. To you shall the nations come from the ends of the earth and say, Our fathers have inherited nothing but lies, worthless things in which there is no profit. Can man make for himself gods? Such are not gods. Therefore, behold, I will make them know. This once I will make them know my power and my might, and they shall know that my name is the Lord. 
Here ends the Old Testament reading. We now continue with the psalm. O Lord, in your strength the king rejoices, and in your salvation how greatly he exults. You have given him his heart's desire, and have not withheld the request of his lips. For you meet him with rich blessings, you set a crown of fine gold upon his head. He asked life of you, you gave it to him, length of days forever and ever. His glory is great through your salvation. Splendor and majesty you bestow on him. For you make him most blessed forever, you make him glad with the joy of your presence. For the king trusts in the Lord, and through the steadfast love of the Most High, he shall not be moved. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, forever. The epistle reading is from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 15. Finally, all of you, have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of that nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Here ends the epistle. Alleluia, alleluia. rise. The Holy Gospel for this Sunday is from the fifth chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke, verses 1 through 11. Glory be to you, O Lord. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on, to hear, in, in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake. But the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats, 
so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Here ends the reading of the Holy Gospel. Praise be to you, O Christ. We confess our faith according to the Nicene Creed.
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Imagine that you are in Peter's shoes in today's gospel. You're squatting there on the beach, cleaning your nets, frustrated that last night you didn't catch any fish. And remember, this isn't just a hobby you have. This is your job. If you don't catch any fish, you don't make any money. For Peter, James, and John, it had been a night wasted. In retrospect, they should have just taken a vacation day because they would have caught just as many fish. But then, Jesus walks up. And not just Jesus by himself, but Jesus being followed by a large group of people who are so interested in hearing what Jesus has to say that they're actually pressing in on them, as Luke tells us. This was a dangerous situation for Jesus. We've seen videos of Black Friday shoppers pressing in on each other, wanting to get in the door to buy a, a microwave or something. That's the kind of situation Jesus was in. It was a dangerous situation for him, and it was one in which the people couldn't actually hear what he was saying. So that is why he turned to Peter and he said, take me out of your boat. So that Jesus could keep on preaching to the crowds who wanted to hear what he had to say without being in harm's way. Now before this, maybe Peter had heard of Jesus, or maybe he hadn't. Same is true for James and John. Either way, we don't know. We also don't know what Jesus was preaching when he sat in the boat. The Holy Spirit has not seen fit to give us a glimpse into that sermon. But we do know from the rest of Jesus' earthly ministry as the Gospels tell us that, what kind of sermon Jesus would have preached from the boat. A sermon focused on repentance and forgiveness, focused on God's undeserved love for mankind, a sermon which Jesus preached not just as a messenger whom God had sent, like the Old Testament prophets who had come before Jesus, but a sermon preached by God himself made flesh. We can be sure that what Jesus preached stuck in Peter's mind. But when Jesus was done preaching to the crowds, he said something to Peter that Peter never would have expected and which Peter was never going to forget. Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Peter replied, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word I will let down the nets. We can tell from how Peter replied to Jesus there that he didn't actually quite believe in Jesus yet. Peter could already, could already tell that Jesus was a man come from God, or at the very least, he was a very powerfully skilled preacher of God's word. But Peter didn't refer to Jesus as Lord. He referred to him as Master. Referring to him as Master is kind of like how when other people would refer to Jesus as Rabbi. It showed that they respected Jesus, but it wasn't quite right. Peter also did not think that what Jesus had asked him to do was a very good idea. Peter wasn't quite sure who Jesus was yet, but he was sure how to fish. It was his job. He knew the time and the place when you were most likely to catch fish. To Peter, what Jesus asked him to do would be like if I tried to go fishing just throwing an empty hook into the water. You're not going to catch anything. But still, out of respect for Jesus, Peter, James, and John did what Jesus said. They sailed out into the water and they let down their nets. Then it became clear to them who Jesus really was. He was not just a preacher. He was God, able to control creation by filling their nets more full of fish than they ever had been before so full that they had to ask their friends to come over and help them carry them in. And even then, all the boats were sinking. So seeing what had just happened, with Jesus' words still ringing 
in his ears, Peter knelt before Jesus and said, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Now, maybe we would have expected Peter to say something else to Jesus. Maybe we would have expected him to say, wow, or just to effusively say, thank you. But the reason why Peter said this, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord, is because through the words Jesus had spoken and through the miracle of the fish, Peter knew that he was in the presence of God. That was why he became afraid. And that is why any of us also would have become afraid if we had been there too. Now, Peter was not an especially sinful man. He wasn't any more sinful than the average faithful Israelite. But as a faithful Israelite who knew God's word, Peter also knew that he was not righteous. He knew that he had not lived up to the moral standards that God had given through the law, just like we have also not lived up to those standards in our lives. Being in the presence of God made Peter more acutely aware of the guilt of his sins than he had ever known that guilt at any other point in his life. But Jesus did not do what Peter asked him to do. He did not depart and leave Peter in his guilt. Jesus said to Peter, do not be afraid. Those words were an absolution from Jesus. They were no less peace-giving for Peter than any other time during his earthly ministry when Jesus forgave someone of their sins. Notice that Jesus did not say to Peter, oh, you're not so bad, or try to convince Peter in some other way that he wasn't as bad of a sinner as he thought he was. Jesus agreed with Peter that he was a sinful man just as Jesus agreed with us when we said this morning that we are poor, miserable sinners who, because of our sins, have offended God and deserve his temporal and eternal punishment. But Peter said to Jesus, do not be afraid. Peter's sins would not cut him off from Jesus. In fact, Jesus wanted Peter to stay with him from now on you will be catching men. By those words, Jesus called Peter and also James and John out of their vocation of being fishermen into a new vocation of being fishers of men. But Jesus did not send them out to be fishers of men right away. First, Jesus trained them to do that. For the next three years, Peter James, John, and the other men whom Jesus would call to be his disciples traveled with Jesus and learned from Jesus. Those three years were their seminary training. That was when the disciples heard Jesus preaching salvation and when they saw him accomplishing salvation. And then when salvation had been accomplished from the cross and from the empty tomb, Jesus appeared to his disciples and he gave them the authority to forgive sins in his name. In today's gospel, which happened at the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry, Jesus called Peter, James, and John to follow him and be fishers of men. But it would only be three years later, when Jesus had accomplished every purpose for which he had come into the human race, that Jesus would actually send his disciples out to do that, to be fishers of men. Before Jesus came and called them, Peter, James, and John were fishermen. And during that time, they were never in complete control of how many fish they were going to catch. All they could do was plan as best they could, fishing at the right time and in the right places. Sometimes the same techniques and strategies for fishing that gave them a great catch would give them a whole lot of nothing like was the case the night before when Jesus came and found them washing their nets on the beach. And that's actually pretty similar to how things were for them when they were out in the world fishing for men. They were still not in control of how many men would be caught. 
meaning that they were not in control of how many people would believe in Jesus and be saved. But still, as apostles, they had to have a plan for how they would work to make that happen. The greatest part of that plan was what Jesus gave to them at the Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. So the plan was to preach God's word and to administer the sacraments. But we know that that was not the whole plan because Peter and the other apostles didn't have one canned sermon that they always preached no matter where they were or who they were talking to. As they fished for men, as they brought God's word to people in different places from different backgrounds, they always tried to preach to people on their level. Peter was called to be an apostle to the Jews. So he isn't actually the best example of this. So as we see how the call from Jesus to be fishers of men lived out and was played out in history, we actually need to zoom out from this gospel to look at Paul. We know that when Paul preached in synagogues to people who were well-versed in the Old Testament, especially in God's promise to send a Savior, that his presentation there was different compared to when he preached to Greeks in the marketplace who had no knowledge of God's word whatsoever. Now this does not mean that when Paul preached to the Jews that he took it seriously, and that when he preached to the Greeks, Paul was silly and frivolous. It just means that Paul adapted his presentation of the gospel to his audience. It's kind of like how the version of the sermon that I preach here in church is different than the version of the sermon that I preach in the school chapel at Prince of Peace when it's my turn to do that during the school year. But the results of the apostles' preaching were not always the same. The book of Acts tells us that on the day of Pentecost, Peter preached a sermon through which thousands of people were brought to faith in the Savior that God had promised to send that he had sent to them. But Acts also tells us about times when the people who heard the apostles preach tried to kill the apostles and sometimes did kill them. Not everyone to whom the apostles preached always believed. Many did, but many did not. Now, I suppose it's possible that the apostles could have had more consistent numerical success if they would have adjusted their preaching in its content to make what they said more appealing to their audience. Many Jews would have believed what the apostles preached if they would have left out that part where Jesus said to go preach to the Gentiles, too. And maybe more Greeks would have believed if Peter and Paul would have said that Jesus was a god, kind of like Hercules was, half god, half man. But of course, the apostles did not do that. They preached God's word, and they administered the sacraments as Jesus had taught them to, and they let God figure out who would and would not believe. Their goal was not simply numerical success growing the Christian church on earth to be as large of an organization as it possibly could be. Their goal was to be faithful in doing what Jesus had called them to do by preaching the word. The Christian church today has that very same calling from God. As God's forgiven children, we have inherited the commission to work together to bring the gospel to every place and every person. Now in doing this, we have not all been called into the office of the ministry to preach the word publicly and forgive sins and administer the sacraments. But we are all part of the priesthood of all believers. And as members of the priesthood of all believers, the general call to be fishers of men permeates all of our other vocations. What that means is that Whatever God has called you to be and to do in life, he has called you to be who you are and do what you do as a Christian. 
living out your faith, trying to glorify God and looking for chances to share your faith. And like the apostles, we are never going to catch people for God on our own. Instead, we let down our nets, so to speak. We share God's word. Hopefully we do so thoughtfully and prayerfully. But then we leave it to God to do what he has promised to do. Working faith and forgiving sins, just like he has already done so for us for the sake of Jesus. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We continue with the offertory verse. rise. Let us pray for the church and for all people according to their needs. Almighty and eternal God, worthy to be held in reverence by all people everywhere, we give you humble and sincere thanks for the countless blessings you have bestowed on us without any merit or worthiness on our part. We praise you especially for preserving for us your saving word, and the holy sacraments. Grant and preserve to your holy church throughout the world purity of doctrine and provide faithful pastors to preach your word with power. Help all who hear the word rightly to understand and truly to believe it. Send laborers into your harvest and open the door of faith to those who do not yet know you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, in mercy, bring to repentance the enemies of your church and grant them amendment of life. Protect and defend your church in all tribulation and danger and sustain with your spirit our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world who experience persecution. Strengthen us and all fellow Christians to set our hope fully on the grace revealed in Christ and help us to fight the good fight of faith so that in the end, we may receive the salvation of our souls. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, bestow your grace on all the nations of the earth. Bless especially our country, its inhabitants, and all who are in authority. Let your glory dwell in our land, that mercy and truth, righteousness and peace may abound in all places. Bless also all those who serve in our armed forces, that they may serve with integrity and honor. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Compassionate Lord, graciously defend us from all calamity by fire and water, from war and pestilence, from scarcity and famine, and from every other evil. Protect and prosper all who labor in their rightful callings, and let all useful arts flourish among us. Be the God and Father of the lonely and the forsaken, the helper of the sick and the needy, the comforter of the distressed and those who sorrow. Look with mercy especially upon those who have requested our prayers, especially your child Charles, his family, and all whom we name in our hearts. 
according to your will. Deliver them out of their troubles and give them the assurance that they have the sure and certain hope of eternal healing and life in Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Grant your Holy Spirit to those who come to your table this day, that they may receive the very body and blood of Jesus in repentance and faith to their abundant blessing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, as we are strangers and pilgrims on earth, help us by true faith and a godly life to prepare for the world to come, doing the work you have given us to do while it is day, before the night comes when no one can work. And when our last hour comes, support us by your power and receive us into your heavenly kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one true God, now and forever. Amen. We continue with the preface to Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is good and right so to do. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you. Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, but chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. For he is the very Paschal Lamb, which was offered for us, and has taken away the sins of the world. By his death, he has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again, he has restored to us everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take ye, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
now continue with the non committers and please rise. <laughs> O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy and yours forever. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through these your salutary gifts. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through them in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one true God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. 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 You may be seated for the hymn.
Good morning again. There's only one announcement not in the bulletin, and that is that the Jamesy guy up here in the front pew, all tired, it's actually really funny to see him and Marilyn both snuggling down for a nap when they camp with Marta the Communion, but not yet. He is going to turn four on Wednesday, the big O four. So maybe we can sing for him. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear James. Happy birthday to you. So we meet again. May God bless and keep all of you.